Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Right. Good morning. Welcome to a good old rainy Sunday morning. <laughs> Rain that we so desperately need. I want to welcome you here and those of you at home uh, and hope that uh, everyone can enjoy this, this day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let and us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, and the announcements and, and the welcome. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, let us not lose sight of the turmoil that's going on around the world, the war in Israel and the war in Ukraine and, and our military personnel that are at home and abroad that may not make it home for Christmas this year and keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And, uh, our other announcements, of course, we have on the screens, uh, the 13th, the E-Tri-CM is Volunteer Day, and the 16th, which is this coming Saturday, is our Place of Love, and then on the 17th, we have our Christmas program here, and that's also the newsletter deadline, uh, and then on December 19th is the Rosenwald Christmas Party, and also the Catalma Women's Group will be needed. Are there any other announcements that I have failed to mention? If not, then I'll turn this over to Reverend Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to add a few announcements. Uh, I'm going to share a few announcements with you. Uh, as you know, many uh, members of our congregation have been struggling with health issues. So please pray for the health of the church family. Uh, especially Barbara needs to have chemotherapy on Wednesday. Uh, so um, uh, she has been full to, uh, faithfully serving by cleaning the church. So we are in need of some help to fill her absence. Uh, there is a sign of sit in the narthex to help clean the church while she is having chemotherapy, uh, we would appreciate it if you could help us when you are available. Uh, thank you in advance for your help, and please keep Barbara in your prayers as she undergoes her treatment. Um, uh, we are blessed to be able to help our neighbors. Uh, there are the, the angel tree, if uh, at the church narthex. Uh, please just take one tag and please share your love and concern for our neighbors. Uh, I also ask that you all would pray over these families. This is a really important time <coughs> of the year where we can surround these families with prayers as the church. Uh, we look forward to you picking up tags and blessing our neighbors with the gift of love and prayers. Uh, please bring all of your gifts to the church by December 19th. Uh, we also want to reach out to our new neighbors at Legacy Lich on December 16th at 10 a.m. Uh, we will hand out our church brochure and share cookies with the residents in at Legacy, Legacy Ridge. Uh, we want them to know that we are here and we, uh, I, I would love for you to join us in welcoming them. On December 16th, please come to the church by 9.50 a.m. 9.50 a.m. We will pray together and then leave for uh, Legacy Ridge. Please keep this ministry in your prayer. Um, this time, <clears throat> I would like to start our worship together. I'd like to invite all of you. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> for this time, I'd like to invite Elsie Young for the Advent reading.
hello, hello, hello. And I'm just very silly today because I have something to tell you. I just have to share with you, it's about the joy, my joy. And the part that I play in the Christmas story, my name is Elizabeth. And you may know my husband is Zachariah, the priest. Oh, thank you. It's on. It's on. Hello. 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 <laughs> Sorry I'm giddy today. And I have a message to tell you. It's about the joy. My joy, I mean, and the part that I play in the Christmas story. My name is Elizabeth, and my husband is Zachariah, the priest. Not so long ago, Zachariah was serving his term at the temple that day. He was long overdue at home. And I'm sure you ladies know when we're waiting for somebody to arrive for dinner. I wondered what could be taking him so long. And when he returned, well, he was speechless. Couldn't talk. Well, with the help of gestures and a writing tablet, Zachariah told me that he had seen an angel while in the temple. This angel had told him, get this, that I was going to have a baby. And at my age, the angel said we would have a son and we would name him John. He said that John would be a great joy and delight to us and that many would rejoice because of his birth. He foretold that John would be great in God's eyes, bringing many of the people of Israel back to the Lord. What more could any woman want than a son who would prepare the way for the Messiah? I went through all the ups and downs of pregnancy, and Zachariah was just very patient. I bet you ladies may not be able to say that anyway. One day, my cousin Mary came to visit. As soon as I greeted her, the baby was in my womb and leaped at the sound of her voice. And the spirit filled me with such joy that I had never known. Through the spirit that my cousin Mary was the, was the Messiah, mother of the Messiah of our Lord. Even my little John was leaping for joy at the coming Messiah. Everything that the angel promised came to pass. My son John grew up to be called John the Baptist. Mary's son, of course grew up to be the savior of us all. And Zechariah, well, he got his voice back. <laughs> what joy was in our household. Now I need to ask you something. Do you feel that the joy of the Lord in your life, as you prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth, in your heart full of the joy of the season? Maybe you 21st century Christians need to recapture the joy of your salvation. If an unborn baby leaped for joy in the presence of the Lord, should we not experience joy when we come into his presence? And if we experience it, should we express it? Well, there is no... Where there is no joy, is there really Jesus? So, capture it. The joy, I mean. You are in the Lord's presence. To let, today we are going to light our second candle representing joy.
<laughs> Thank you, Elsie, for your uh, Advent reading. It uh, inspires us during the Advent. And thank you, Donna, once again, for preparing all these uh, Advent reading. Uh, once again, uh, I'd like to invite all of you for the call to worship, opening hymn, and opening prayer. Call to worship. In the middle of dark times, our Lord cries out, Comfort, comfort my people. When it seems as though we cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel, our Lord says to us, Be at peace, for your time of difficulty has entered. Lord, we await the time of comfort and peace. Lord, we are thankful for your compassion and never-failing love. Amen. Would you rise? Let's praise God together. Uh, hymn number 220, and just from the uh, realms. realms of glory. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, 
And with, with this time, let's greet uh, each other. Uh, uh, let's taunt our neighbors and wave and say each other, God loves you and so do I. God loves you, so do I. God loves you and so do I. Uh, please come all, uh, I'd like to invite all the children to come forward for the young Christian time. Please come forward, all the children. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I am so excited that today is the second day of Advent, as we heard Miss Elsie say. That means it's only two weeks until Christmas Eve. Is that pretty exciting? That is exciting. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell me your first name. Can you do that? It'll be like this. My name is Hal. too hard of a question was it being that one already. Your name is one of the first gifts your parents give you when they find out they're going to have a baby. They start thinking about what name shall we give our child. And you know back when us old Christians were having babies, we had to choose two names because we didn't know whether we would have a boy or a girl until you got born. But nowadays parents can find out pretty soon whether they're going to have a boy or a girl. And so they start thinking about what name they will give their child. Like some go to the library and get books and look, try, try to find out what's the most popular name, or nowadays they get on the computer. Some families choose names based on their relatives, their ancestors. For example, my <coughs> name comes from my father, William Harold. I'm a junior. We named our first son after my father, William Harold III. Callan's pretty thankful that his dad and mom broke that tradition <laughs> and named him Callan Knucklehead. But <laughs> we're, we're pretty thankful for that. But do you know if your name has special meaning? Some parents choose their, their child's name based on the special meaning to the family. Do you know what your name might mean, young? Mom and Dad got it off of a TV show. Off a TV show. <laughs> a cartoon, no doubt. <laughs> well, some families choose their names based on just what's popular, what, what feels good, what, what sounds good. I wonder, when, when Mary and Joseph found out that Mary was going to have a baby, I wonder how they chose the name for their baby. Any idea? They didn't have a library to go to. They couldn't get on the computer and, and find what the, what the most popular names were going on around in Bethlehem at the time. And they, they really didn't have a family. They weren't even married yet. So they didn't, they didn't have relatives they could name the baby. Do you know how they chose the name of Jesus? How? From an angel. From an angel? You know more about it? We actually talked about it in, in Debbie's class this morning. An angel came to Joseph. You see, back in the day, it was the man's part. It was his role to name the child. And an angel did come to Joseph in a dream and said, Mary's going to have a baby that was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's going to be God's son, and you will name him Jesus. Do you know what the name Jesus means? Because the angel said, you will name him Jesus because he will save his people. He will save the people. And it also means Emmanuel, that God is with us. He's the Savior. So Jesus' name means Savior. So when you think about your name and you will carry it forever and carry it proudly, then also think about the name of Jesus and what it means that he will come and save us from our sins. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. For these children and what they mean to their families and what they mean to our church and the future for our Christian faith. And thank you for Jesus and for the fact that he did come at Christmas to save us from our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. In my bag, I have, in my bag, I'm sorry, Mike. In my bag, I have bookmarks for you. And it has on there the name of Jesus. And I have enough that you can have one and, and take one for a friend that you can give away. 
so that you can remember our time together and remember how special Jesus is in your life. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Hall, for sharing your talent with us. I absolutely like the old Christian time. Uh, <clears throat> this time we have the opportunity, the blessings God has blessed us to return to God. Please stand before our offering to be present to God. Scripture passage comes to us from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through the first part of 15. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it's page 238. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ken, for your scripture reading. Let us pray together before we share the God's message. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather together in this sacred space, we pause to express our deep gratitude for the privilege of worship. Thank you for bringing us here and allow us to share in the fellowship of faith. Lord, we seek your presence and grace to, full, to fill this place. May your spirit guide our worship and draw us close to you and to each other. We open uh, our heart to receive your word and ask for your blessing upon our time together. We lift, we lift up before you those among us who are facing health challenges. We pray for your gracious touch and healing power to be at work in their lives. Grant strength, comfort, and resilience to those who care for them, that they may find that they <clears throat> may find comfort and strength in your boundless love in difficult times. In a world of turmoil, 
we lift up a special prayer for peace. We, play, we pray against the gun violence in the nation and ask for your protective hand to guide innocent lives. Extend your grace and protection to those affected by conflicts and wars around the world. May your love be a source of comfort to the innocent victims caught in the midst of strife. Lord, we honestly seek revival within our church. Pour out your spirit upon us, bringing peace, unity, and healthy growth. May our community be a beacon of your love shining brightly in the world. As you prepare to delve into your world, we ask that you open our hearts and minds. May your truth resonate within us and guide us in our daily lives. We offer these prayers with faith and trust in your unfailing love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I pray that you will experience God's grace and peace while we are sharing God's message this morning. Today we enter the second week of Advent. This is the time, this is a time symbolizes Uh, this is the this is a time symbolizes waiting for Jesus' second coming. As children of God, Jesus' return is the goal of our present life, and we await His return with the joy and hope of eternal life. But many people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. As their Savior, will approach the day of Jesus' return with fear. They don't want to leave their nice homes and wonderful lives to meet Jesus Christ. Some people wish that they would come later. I once met a Christian in church who said something like this. He believes in heaven, but he doesn't want to go there yet. He wants to stay on earth and enjoy his life a little longer. But real Christians are too look forward to Lord Lord's return to be with him forever. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible tells believers to look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The Bible teaches us that Jesus' return is not something to fear or avoid. The Bible testifies that heaven is a, is a perfect place with our Lord, without pain and tears. So how does the Bible tell us believers to get ready for the last days? Last day. Today I would like to share with you the hope field attitude we should have towards life as we await Jesus' return. First, as believers, we must acknowledge that Jesus will come, uh, come back again and that there will be a judgment on the last day. People who live in this age of advancement think the last judgment and the return of Jesus Christ is just a myth. They understand the world based on uh, evidence they can see. So this leads them to seeing the last judgment and second coming as a religious fantasy. They think that the uh, world will continue to exist as it does now, forever. For people in an age that values reason, it seems natural not to believe. But this is just a big misconception of non-believers. The return and judgment of Jesus Christ will definitely take place. The Bible records past events 
where God judged the world. So we can be sure that these things will happen in the future. Second Peter chapter 2 uh, talks about God's judgment using example from the Old Testament. It tells the story of Noah, uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In uh, verses 5 to 6 it says, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the, to the ungodly. In the days of Noah, God judged the ungodly world with a great flood. The Old Testament cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were, were also judged by God with fire. God can judge this whole world at any time as He wills. These events in the Bible help us to be aware that the second coming and judgment by Jesus could happen at any time. Jesus also talked about, uh, talked many times about the last judgment and his returns in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 30, Jesus said, at that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nation of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In Matthew 24, verse 44, Jesus told us to get ready for His return. He said, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not ex uh, expect Him. Matthew 25, uh, 31 to 33 tells us how he will judge the world. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will put the sheep on his right and the goat on his left. The Bible is the true word of God without lies. So what God has said and promised in the Bible will surely happen in His time. God will judge our world, world just as He did with Sodom and Gomorrah and in Noah's time. As Jesus promised us in the Bible, He will surely come again. Then we might ask, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus promised His return. So why, why hasn't His return and judgment happened yet? The reason it take, it, uh, it's taking a long time for Jesus to return is because His patient love for us. He wants to save as many as possible. He is waiting for us to repent and return to Him. Let's read verse 9 together. Ready, go. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand His slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. God waits because He's not focused on judging us. He's focused on saving us. God's love for us is patient. He waits for us for a long time like a father waiting for his prodigal son for a long time to return. God wants us to repent and turn from sin and He wants to save even one more person. 
That's why his return seems delayed. But if, but if it will surely happen in the future. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the only, the only reason the Lord is taking his time to return is because he wants us to turn away from sin. He's giving us a chance. The sin the Bible talks about is when we put ourselves before God. It's a living, uh, it's living as if we are the Lord of our own life. When we sit in the Lord's place acting like the ruler of our own life, we need to step down from that position. The Lord of our life can be only be Jesus Christ. Everything we have belongs to Him, so of course, we must use our time, wealth, and talents for the Lord. We are not even serving the church with our own time and things. We are just using what the Lord has entrusted to us for Him. We are His servant. Uh, so it's a sin to use what the Lord has given us just for ourselves as if it's our uh, it's our to hold on to. So it's only natural that we use our time, talents, and wealth for the Lord. The Lord waits with patience for us to turn away from our sins, but we sometimes don't listen to Him and we stubbornly continue to live in sin. What does it look like when we stubbornly refuse to turn away from sin? Some people in the church think it is fine to keep living the way they want to, ignoring what God says. They might think, uh, I've been living like this for many years, and God hasn't punished me, so I will keep, in, I will keep doing what I want. They don't help others in need and trying to solve problems on their own uh, instead of listening to the Holy Spirit and praying to God for help. Although they say Jesus is their Lord, they don't ask Him for guidance in their lives. They even judge others as if they are God. But it is, is it really okay to live this way? It is like ignoring the love and grace that God has been longing to give us. The only reason what uh, the only reason we haven't been punished for our sins is because God is patiently waiting for us to repent. We need to look within ourselves, ask the Holy Spirit for help, and turn away from sin. Please remember God's patient grace and love toward us. Then how should we live as we await the judgment and return of our Lord? According to Bible passage, we should live holy and godly lives before God. Let's read, uh, let's read uh, verses 11 together. Ready, go. Since everything will be destroyed, what kind of people should you be? Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live in holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed is coming. As the scripture says, we must live holy and godly lives as we await for Jesus' return. The meaning of being holy is having a deep respect and fear for God. To live a holy life, understanding that our lives are examined by God. As a result, we need to examine ourselves often before Him. And in the Bible, living godly life means doing the, doing the assigned task God wants us to do. God's task for us can be summed up 
in one sentence. What is it? Loving our neighbors as ourselves. So, living a holy and godly life means faithfully loving others just like we love ourselves before God. This is God's will for us. The Bible says that this is how we prepare for the Lord's return and judgment. What is the driving force that makes us turn away from our sin and live a holy and godly life? What enables us to live this way? God wants to us. We live by thinking about how our actions here on earth affect our life in heaven. Through the hope of heaven, we can turn away from sin and joyfully carry out God's divine mission. The big difference between us Christians and unbelievers is how we see the world. We see everything with a focus on heaven. We get strength when we, everything out in our life matches how life is in heaven. But if we are living in sin that will negatively affect our way to heaven, we must ask for help of the Holy Spirit to repent and turn away from the sin. For example, if someone is unkind to us, it doesn't mean we cut off from God's love or blocked from entering heaven. But if we get angry and want to get back at them, that's a problem. In those times, we need to pray, ask the Holy Spirit for help, and change how we think, I mean repent. Also, being poor or sick will not stop us from going to heaven. But the sin of lust, slander, and pretending to be God is a problem. Those who practice, those who practice these things will not inherit the heaven because they are contrary to what heaven is. And the, and the other driving force that makes us turn away from our sin is the joy of looking forward to experiencing heaven one day. The hope of heaven gives us strength. We not only remember the Lord return, but also long for it. The strength to live according to His will is to live every day with the hope of heaven. Do you, you remember when you were a kid and had a picnic coming? A few days before the picnic, any problems didn't bother you. You were even okay when your siblings teased you because you were excited about the picnic. Because you had hope of a picnic. Our present life is like this. May our expectation of heavenly joy inspire us to, to turn away from our sins to live holy and godly lives. May we eagerly await the glorious day when we shall be in the presence of our Lord. Friends, this is all said in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> would you rise? This time let us affirm our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's close our time together in hymn as we sing a hymn number 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. and the judgment to come. Help us live with hope and joy, turning away from sin, as we await for your glorious return. We recognize, recognize your perfect timing, a sign of your patient love. Grant us strength to live holy and godly lives. Help us to follow your divine mission of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Father, as we dismiss, may the peace of God the Father, the grace of Jesus the Son, the guidance and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.